Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Kevin King, Adam Heist, and Michael E. Gerber, the author of The E-Myth. Today, I'm speaking with Hilton Hart, the CEO at Edison IP Enforcement. And we are going to be talking a lot about the permanent solution to stop counterfeiters and actually collect money from them. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Hilton, I started my business back in 2015 and grew it to an eight-figure brand in seven years, but it took a lot longer than it really needed to. I wish I would have had a mentor along the way that would have helped me overcome a lot of the stumbling blocks that I ran into, such as you know having counterfeits knock off my products as soon as we put them up online. Number two, having cash flow issues, hiring the wrong people at the wrong time, right? I wish that I would have had somebody to be that guide. And so to our listeners that are hitting similar stumbling blocks or obstacles and want to know the next steps to take their brand to the next level, go to ecombreakthrough.com. That's ecom with two M's to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. All you need to do is email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com and in your subject line, say strategy audit and then plead your case as to why I should choose you and your brand to work with for this month's strategy audit. But today I am super excited to introduce you all to Hillen. Hillen is the CEO at Edison IP Enforcement where he has helped brands sue over 80,000 counterfeiters and collect over $61 million from them. He's a former software engineer turned entrepreneur and investor. So with that introduction, welcome to the show, Hilton. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. <laughs> Hilton, I am super excited to have you on the show because as we talked prior to hitting the record button, this is something that I have dealt with all of 2023, really trying to like scratch my head, try to put together an IP protection strategy for our brand because we have over 1,300 SKUs. And from day one, all the way back in that 2015 era, as soon as we've launched products on Amazon, it was six months, three months later, and somebody would be knocking us off. And back in the day when I first started, I was like, well, there's not really a whole lot I can do. Just let it happen, right? And I kicked myself in the rear end for that type of thinking back then because I think about the millions of dollars that we've lost because I didn't take IP enforcement and infringement seriously. And I let people, you know, counterfeit, uh, make derivatives of our products and let them get away with it. And, uh, you know, we've, we've paid the price and I don't want to know what that monetary price is most likely. But Hill and I would love to hear kind of your background of what got you into this space of doing IP enforcement for e-commerce sellers. Uh, well, it started in 2016 and not actually with me, uh, but my brother, Molson Hart, uh, he uh, had and continues to operate a toy business. And I believe at the time he had 23 counterfeiters on Amazon that he found and he linked up with an attorney and he, he sued them uh, using a, a very uh, a less known legal strategy. Um, and I think all in, uh, his legal bills were $8,000 and he collected almost uh, 120000 So he permanently stopped the counterfeiters and he 10 times his, his investment or his money in the process. Um, so he was pretty happy with that result. And he thought to himself, uh, I, I think he actually was in the shower when he had this idea. But, you know, how do I help other e-commerce brands and businesses do that exact process? Um, and so that's that's actually how we started uh, the business that I operate today. And uh, since then, I think we've done done that exact same thing, uh, legal strategy for almost 200 different companies. That's amazing. Um, 
I love I love a good business idea that starts in the shower. So uh, <laughs> Hill and I love kind of what you touched on right there was super important that I want to like highlight for our listeners. You said instead of just filing a takedown notice on Amazon, which I think we're all very familiar with. If you're brand registered, you can go to your, you know, brand registry and IP violation tool, right? And you can file, you know, notices, whether somebody's using your trademark or for copyrights or patent infringement, et cetera. But what I think you said that really stuck out to me is instead of just taking them down and filing that infringement notice on Amazon, you're suing them which then allows you to actually collect money from them. And in your brother's example, that was a six figure number that he was able to collect. And I would assume not just from one seller, that was from multiple counterfeiters um, that then, you know, they might've all been relatively small, maybe a couple thousand dollars for each of them. But like in total, a six figure sum is no small fee. And I think that when you sue somebody, and you also collect money from them, they're going to make sure that they steer way clear of you in the future because they're like, okay, these guys take their stuff seriously. It's not even worth rattling that cage. Whereas if you just do an IP infringement, I mean, Amazon, you know, does a little, you know, hey, shame, shame, don't do that again. But there's no like teeth to it. And so it's like, oh, I'll try it again because I got away with it for six months and I made all this money from it. So does that sound right? And, you know, is that kind of logic the way you're approaching this? That That's exactly right. Uh, I, we call submitting takedowns on e-commerce marketplaces or sending cease and desist letters, uh, basically a whack-a-mole strategy or a slap on the wrist. Um, it's not a permanent solution. It's more of a Band-Aid type temporary solution. Um, so we found that suing and collecting from your counterfeiters is the most effective strategy. Okay, I love that. Now, Hill, and can you explain the term counterfeiters um, in more detail, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, for a lot of our listeners, especially those that are new to the e-commerce space, and maybe they've grown a seven-figure brand just on their own, and like myself, I'd, I wasn't aware of copyright law, uh, design patents, utility patents, trademark law. During my first year or two of business, because and that's why I allowed those counterfeiters to continue to happen. So why don't you explain in in your words what you see as like what's a counterfeiter? A counterfeiter is someone that's trying to make their product or their business or uh, brand look like your product or your brand, um, and they do that by infringing on various types of IP. Um, so like you said, uh, the main ones are trademarks. Uh, copyrights, and then the two types of design uh, of patents, which are design and utility patents. Um, and, you know, they have subtypes and we can go into to all of that. Um, but but that's mainly it. Okay. Let's dive into all of those different, you know, ways that you could protect yourself from an IP um, protection <laughs> standpoint and the recommendations. So I think this will be a two part question. Give us a high level overview of the different ways you can tick can protect your brand with IP. And then secondly, let's discuss maybe some scenarios of, you know, when to use a utility patent versus copyright versus design patent, et cetera. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start with trademarks. Um, you know, your brand name would be uh, covered by a trademark um, or particularly a word mark. Uh, so some, some text. Um, then you might also have a logo, uh, you know, which is, colorful and has a design to it. Um, and so that would be a different type of trademark, a logo, a logo mark. Um, and then from there, uh, you might have taken photographs of your product or made uh, a video um, or maybe wrote, you know, some large piece of text. Um, and so those past three examples would more so fit into the copyright bucket. Um, and then next uh, for design patent, um, that's specifically uh, describes and provides you protection over the, the unique design of your product. So think something like uh, a Coca-Cola glass bottle. Um, you know, a customer might see that and, and really think it's a Coke bottle and not something else like Pepsi or whatever. And then uh, finally, you've a utility patent, which covers and protects the actual function of your product. Um, so, you know, you made a better mousetrap or uh, something like that. 
Yeah. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Um, with the copyright, um, I think that's probably the easiest one that would apply to everybody, right? You talked about the photos that you take of your product, right? And so if you create your listing on Amazon, you have your white background image and then a bunch of secondary images. What we've seen with our brand is there's a good number of competitors that will literally go steal our secondary images and go Photoshop their own product into those images. Are you saying that's something that we could actually go and sue somebody for and be able to collect money from potentially? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, in IP, the answer is it always depends. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if they're, they're making, you know, minor uh, edits or just putting their product in the picture over yours, um, and it's, you know, it's obvious that the work, uh, the picture they, they're using uh, originally came from, from your work or your photograph, um, you can definitely enforce that. Um, now, uh, when it comes to trying to get Amazon to help you out in that situation, um, you know, when they're the judge, jury and executioner and they make money, whether you sell the product or your counterfeiter does, um, you need a lot more black and white uh, examples of infringement and, and you need to, you know, have like a 99 percent chance of uh, success, um, it, you know, in that takedown process in order to actually stop the counterfeiter. Um, if you know, if if Amazon's uh, experts, wherever they are, um, decide that there's not enough infringement or it's just different enough, they're likely to not accept your takedown. Um, and that's where it really helps to go the actual legal route. Interesting. OK, I like that. Now, with copyright infringement, I think that one's important to focus on because with a well, and I think let's dive into those the four different ways to protect yourself, right? You can file a trademark for your brand really at any time, right? And then a copyright, you can register at any point in time, correct? And I think copyright's unique that you get a figurative copyright. It's not an official copyright, but it is copyright protectable. Um, the moment you publish or create something, but to get a copy, to be copyright registered, then allows you to collect for damages. Is that correct? And tell me about like the timing on that. Is there a time limitation to where once you've created the product, you have a year in order to file and register the copyright? Or could you say, I'm creating hundreds of images a month. I don't want to go copyright register all of these images. But maybe once you see somebody infringing on an image, then you go register it. So it has the potential to sue. Can you kind of walk me through that? Sure. Um, I do want to point out that I'm not an attorney, um, so you should definitely talk to yours or talk to ChatGPT uh, <laughs> for a while. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, all, all the IP uh, and the damages are kind of treated differently. Um, so I'll focus on copyright first. Um, you're right. If, uh, if you never file or you never submit your image to the cop U.S. Copyright Office and actually get a registration number, um, you still can protect other people from using your image. That said, um, the damages that are associated with that infringement before registration are lower because, you know, the counterfeiter, uh, it's less egregious, right? There's no registration. In order for them to know that your, your image is yours, uh, they have to do like a lot of searching and try to figure out, you know, who, who owns this image, where did it come from? Um, so you get actual damages. Uh, which I believe are are uh, the profits that um, they gain from using your image uh, to sell product or do whatever um, before. And that's before registration. Um, after registration, you can begin to get more damages, um, which I believe would be statutory. Um, and so off the top of my head, I don't remember, but it might be some fixed amount or uh, it could be three times profits or, and, or it becomes your profits after registration, not theirs. Um, and so, you know, trademarks uh, work in a, in a slightly different way, uh, which I can explain. Um, you, can act, you actually don't need to register your trademark. Um, and be, it's actually more protectable than copyrights because it's a lot easier to find a brand name. You can type it into Google and quickly find, you know, who operates this business and who sells products with this brand name. Um, so I, I believe the damages for trademarks uh, infringement is, uh, is greater before registration. 
And then also you can register your trademark after the infringement occurs. Um, and then the past infringement kind of is in some ways is able, uh, the damages associated with the past infringement before registration can carry forward. That's awesome. a lot of information. <laughs> it it, it is. It, it, it's a lot of information, but it, it's so important for, for people to understand this. So hit the rewind button if you need to. Need to probably slow this down if you're listening to this 1.52x speed because there's there's a lot of information to digest. Um, but now Hilton on the on the opposite end, utility and design patents. I believe there is a one year time frame for people to actually register, right? And if you don't mm-hmm. register, you're kind of out of out of luck. And I believe that would be difficult to sue somebody for if you don't even have a a patent on mm-hmm. something. Is that true? It it is. Um, I don't know the the exact timing off the top of my head, but uh, patents are unlike trademarks and copyrights, and that's a major factor. Um, I I do want to just point out to the previous point, it costs like fifty five dollars to uh, register some images with the copyright office. So there's no excuse, and you can submit hundreds of images just and get them all registered at once. Um, so you everyone's got to go out and do that. It's super easy. You don't even really need an attorney. Um, but, but yeah, you also need to register uh, your patents as well as early as possible. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Now, Hilton, you talked about, there's a couple ways I want to take the, the direction of our conversation, but you talked about first taking down people on Amazon. And right now, Amazon's kind of playing that judge, jury, and executioner all at the same time. And guess what? You're probably working with a lot of people overseas that have limited legal backgrounds to the best of their knowledge, and they're not really doing it justice. At least that's what we have found very distinctively on Amazon. I can't tell you the number of times we filed takedowns on products or competitors that have been blatantly infringing us, where every U.S.-based attorney that I've spoken to is like, yes, you would win this in court all day and night. Yet you go to Amazon and they're like, nope, rejected. Sorry, we don't see that there's any uh, any copyright infringement on this. So knowing that, you know, part of what you guys do, in addition to helping sue counterfeiters, you also help sellers to actually, you know, file these takedown notices on Amazon as well. So what would be, you know, can you kind of walk us through the steps that you guys follow in order to file takedowns specifically on Amazon? and? What, you know, how do you find success with those? Gotcha. Um, well, the, the most important thing is that you kind of gather evidence of the infringement. Because um, if, if you submit a takedown and the listing's gone, um, you know, you, you basically can't do anything going forward if you didn't keep proper records of what, what happened. Um, and, you know, that might be really useful in the future if that, that seller or business entity continues to infringe. You might want to take some more action. Um, So what we like to do is gather the evidence of infringement first, submit the takedown, see what Amazon does um, or the other e-commerce marketplace, um, see what the infringer does. um, And then, you know, from there, if you have enough infringement and it it would be financially viable to to file a lawsuit, uh, you can do that. Um, So we kind of do it in that order. Uh, What's really unfortunate is we see businesses sign up with these takedowns companies that only do takedowns. And, you know, they wipe out all the infringement, all the counterfeiters take the trademark out of their product listing, maybe stop using uh, some of the images, but yet they still have that competitor there who's selling the same Mm. product and is right there alongside them on Amazon. Um, And it it really doesn't have the same effect. Um, So you want to keep good records, gather evidence of infringement, submit the takedown, and then save you know, the, the optionality of, of suing that seller later. I like that. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense. So A, filing takedowns on Amazon is, yes, important, but then making sure you've documented things. So if they make slight changes to it where they become technically compliant and they keep growing, you still have the optionality to sue them and go back in time um, for what they did in the past, right? But you've got to have, I, I think you mentioned like you want to purchase their product, right? Take photos of it. You want to take screenshots of their Amazon listing and just kind of document what things looked at, looked like at what date and time. 
uh, before you actually send those cease and desist letters or IP infringement claims on Amazon. Is that true? Exactly. You, you have to do that first. Um, and you really have no idea what Amazon or the mar- e-commerce marketplace is going to do. Um, we see design patent uh, takedowns uh, just get rejected at a very high rate. Um, and so, you know, you're going to need that evidence if you're going to want to stop that seller from infringing on your design patent. Um, or, you know, if someone's spelling your trademark slightly differently, um, you're going to have to go the legal route. So you, you really need that evidence um, before you submit a takedown, whether it's successful or not. Okay. Now that kind of brings up a, an interesting point. I would love to hear kind of what your experience has been submitting takedowns on Amazon. It sounds like design patents aren't overly successful right now. At least Amazon's not willing to uh, accept them. I don't know what utility patents are like and copyrights. It's all over the place. But would you mind kind of going through the different types of infringement, right? Go through trademark, copyright, design patents. Tell us what your experience is, work specifically on Amazon, getting those takedowns filed and what your acceptance rate typically is with those. And if you get rejected, what do you do next? Do you keep doing it? Do you keep filing until it gets across the right person desk? Or does that kind of jeopardize your own account where Amazon's like, all right, you lose your privilege of filing takedowns if you keep sending this. So I know that's a loaded question, but... uh, I'd love to hear you dive into that. Uh, you know, submitting takedowns through, I guess we can mainly talk about Amazon. Um, you're going to want to submit takedowns through brand registry. Uh, that's a lot better than the, they have a form that you don't need to use brand registry to, to, to submit takedowns through. Um, so trademarks and copyrights, they're more straightforward, uh, you know, submitted through brand registry. Uh, the, the acceptance rates are pretty high, um, but, you know, it depends on the infringement and uh, the IP uh, involved. Um, so I'll say that they're higher than the, the, the patents. Um, then you have uh, design patents. They're, they're still easier than utility patents for the, the marketplace to analyze the infringement because trademarks, copyrights, and design patents, uh, all the, the analysis for infringement is based on an ordinary observer test. Um, and so someone even without IP training in theory should be able to decide uh, to some degree if there's infringement. I mean, you're just looking at, you know, the, the brand owner's product or their IP versus, you know, the pot- allegedly infringing product. Um, so unfortunately, though, uh, somehow Amazon just really doesn't like design patents. Um, I don't know why that is. Um, and then finally, uh, good luck with utility patents. Um, and they they want to steer people towards their APEX program. Um, the forget what the acronym stands for, uh, but basically, I don't know if your viewers know how that program works. But both sides, uh, the brand owner, IP owner, and the infringer both put up money. Uh, they're required to, and uh, the winner of that submission or, or claim gets their money back. Um, and so, in some ways, if you can get your counterfeiter to lose, I think it's five thousand dollars. Um, that can be pretty powerful. Um, but you mm. need to keep in mind that, you know, they might have made a million dollars infringing on your patent. So maybe I wouldn't recommend that scenario. <laughs> um, and then to your your very last question, yeah, you if your submissions are not being accepted, you need to be very careful because if you just uh, bombard them with rejected submissions over and over again, um, they actually keep track of that. It's a metric. Um, and then they might stop accepting just like totally black and white, uh, obvious infringement. Um, so you don't want to jeopardize your brand registry account. Uh, I mean, maybe you don't want to piss off Amazon. Um, and so you got to be careful. Um, and that's why it makes a lot of sense to, you can do the takedowns that you know are going to be successful. And then when you, when you have those rejections, you still have the option to, to go the legal route later. Okay. Yeah. So I guess that that would be my question then is if you get rejections and you've got other attorneys or other people that are like, yeah, that's blatant infringement, whether it's trademark or copyright. At what point is it worth, you know, if Amazon's rejecting them, what do you do? Uh, do you just let that seller keep selling? And then for how long um, can you file a lawsuit? Kind of like walk me through that kind of decision process that you think a brand owner should go through if they've got somebody, Amazon's 
refusing to take it down, but you're very confident that there is infringement going on. Well, uh, if you're going to go the legal route, uh, you want to make sure you at least don't lose money suing the counterfeiter. Um, so, you know, picking the right attorney, the right litigator is very important. Um, we really like to hire attorneys for that kind of litigation on contingency um, because it, it makes them financially aligned with us. And we know that if they stop a counterfeiter and collect money from them using a settlement or a judgment, they're going to get paid too. Um, so I'd recommend finding a contingency fee attorney. Um, from there, you kind of need to, uh, or maybe before that, uh, it doesn't really matter. You need to look at these, am these accounts. And you, you need to figure out, you know, does this person have money that I can actually collect? Um, a lot of people don't think that you can collect from someone, an infringer in Asia or, you know, China specifically is where we see a lot of uh, infringers and counterfeiters. Um, but you actually can. You can collect from their assets in the U.S. Um, so you kind of need to, to work backwards and figure out, you know, uh, do they have bank accounts in the U.S.? Do they use payment processors like PayPal? Um, you know, how much money's in their Amazon account? Um, you can look at, you know, how much seller feedback they're getting to try to work that backwards. You know, are their products priced highly? Uh, that's going to cause there to be more money in their account, um, assuming their volume's high as well. Um, you want to look at the infringement, um, the actual product listing where they're infringing on your IP. Does it have a lot of reviews? That might be a proxy to determine that that listing's doing a lot of sales and then therefore there's a lot of damages and you can collect a lot of money. Um, so that that's kind of the analysis that you'd go through for a single infringer. Um, and then from there, you want to decide how many infringers are there? Are there 50 or 100? Well, you know, now your damages potentially are 50 or 100 times greater. And if you sue those 100 counterfeiters in one single lawsuit, um, it's more likely that you're not going to lose money trying to collect from money from them with your legal yeah. fees and expenses. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Where would somebody go? You know, I think your first point is, you know, find a contingency based attorney. If you feel like, you know, this competitor or a group of competitors is selling enough volume, um, where would you find contingency based attorneys or do you have any recommendations there? Um, well, I, you know, I'm biased and I'm the guy to go to. <laughs> Um, but you know, uh, if you look in the Northern district of Illinois, um, this exact kind of lawsuit is very popular there. Um, so in theory, you just need to find a, uh, an attorney that's comfortable with this kind of litigation and explain the success that you can have in, in suing counterfeiters. Um, and then basically give them a couple of those cases to, to basically copy. Um, mm. so, uh, that's what we specialize in. Um, we, we file cases all over the country, mainly in uh, Illinois, Florida, and Texas. Um, and yeah, that's our, that's our thing. I love that. Okay. And another really important thing that you talked about is, and because I've spoken to a lot of attorneys over the years for our brand as well. <clears throat> and one thing that I've heard a lot of from a lot of attorneys is that, sorry, if that seller is overseas, good luck getting anything from them right? But what you mentioned, and I've heard about this strategy from others as well, is that even if they're located in Asia, you can still sue them and collect money from them, especially if they're suing, if they're selling on Amazon US, they're going to have a US bank account, right? And you could freeze those assets. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, can you kind of walk through like, how would you actually collect money from somebody that's based in Asia? Because there's no way you're going to be able to send them a cease and desist letter, right? And typically, they're never going to reply to any emails. Um, they're just like, I'm protected. I'm over here in Asia. You can't touch me. And uh, I think you have a really good, I don't, I don't know, call it a ninja hack, but it's all within the, the laws of uh, the US that you could actually do this. So can you kind of walk me through how are you actually collecting from somebody that's an overseas seller? So the most critical part to the legal strategy is what's called a temporary restraining order. Um, and it becomes permanent. So the temporary part is not that important. Um, but what that does is a federal judge will actually grant you the ability, like you said, to, to freeze and restrict the disbursement of funds from your infringers, e-commerce accounts or payment processor accounts. 
Um, and so, you know, when someone's based in Asia and doesn't really respect your intellectual property or U.S. law, uh, that's pretty critical in terms of collecting money from them. Um, so you you get that court order. It's actually a surprise uh, court order. You don't need to notify the, the counterparty at all in advance. Um, so you get that court order. Uh, you send it to Amazon, for example. Uh, they will give you uh, the email addresses of all the people that are infringing on your IP. They'll tell you, they'll freeze the money in their accounts. Um, you'll need to serve that order to PayPal, for example, as well for payment processors. Um, and uh, so, yeah, they give you their email address to serve them after the freeze is in place. They tell you how much money's in their account. They tell you how many sales those uh, alleged infringers uh, made. Um, so that way, you know, you're not relying on the counterfeiter to tell you how much profit or revenue they've done using your IP. Um, and so then from there, you're able to actually settle with them. And if they choose not to settle, you can obtain a judgment, which allows you to collect the money that you froze. Um, mm. And, you know, suing sellers in, in Asia is actually a lot easier than, than you would think. Um, you know, once you have leverage over them, uh, they're very unlike uh, U.S. based companies. They're not litigious. They like to work out deals and settle. Um, so, you know, you don't really have to worry about really protracted litigation and expensive legal fees and things like that. Interesting. So you're saying that, yeah, I guess if you were to file a lawsuit, right, in order for Amazon to freeze their account, you're going to need to name Amazon in that lawsuit or no? Uh, no, you, you don't have to name Amazon. Um, what you name uh, a list of effectively a uh, Amazon accounts or e-commerce accounts. Um, so they call these cases Schedule <laughs> A cases because Schedule A is a okay. list of the hundred plus defendants. And so that's where you put, you know, their their uh, a link to their Amazon store, or maybe you know okay. you provide a table in the lawsuit of the merchant IDs to identify okay. the defendants. And then the judge would then give you some type of order to go tell Amazon that they have to freeze their account? Exactly. So you, you take that order and the Schedule A list of defendants and you bring that to Amazon and then they just do a simple database query and you know toggle something in, in their software to freeze the money. Interesting. Pretty, straight, pretty straightforward then. And then you're finding that those overseas sellers are, once they kind of get served, right? Because that you're going to get their real email address at that point you're finding that the you don't have to continue through going through the court process. You're finding a lot of people are settling outside of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, about half, uh, if I had to guess, around half of the defendants in our clients' cases uh, choose to settle. Um, and, it, and it makes sense. You know, they, they want to regain access to their account. Um, they want the money that's in it. So, you know, someone might settle for more or less uh, than the money that's in, in their account. And that's a factor. They don't want to strike against their account. They don't want to start over from scratch. They don't want to lose their reviews. Um, so, you know, you do have significant leverage over these, these, these counterfeiters. Um, and in the situations where they don't settle, um, you know, that does happen. And there are serial counterfeiters that create new stores all the time, um, which they'll do. So you, you take the money in the account that you identified the, the uh, account that chose not to settle. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's really expensive for them. And it uh, it's like a, a gut punch, you know, so <laughs> they're going to know that they'd rather infringe uh, on some other brand rather than yours, you know, a brand that's only doing takedowns, not taking thousands of dollars from them whenever they infringe. Yeah, man. <laughs> I, I love that. I think that this is like such a mindset shift. Everybody always talks about like, you know, filing takedowns, Nobody's talking about like, let's make this permanent. And actually, can this become a revenue stream of your business, right? Um, because there are a lot of more litigious companies where their IP strategy is actually to generate revenue for the business. And so I think for our listeners, like if you can flip your mindset and say, it's not just about protecting your own brand and sales. It's about, you know, if, the, if you have a lot of counterfeiters, this could actually be a revenue generating opportunity, so to speak. Going back with your brother's example, it was a 10x return on an $8,000 investment of his, right? Um, so I, I love that aspect, Hillen. Hillen, I would love to maybe, we've gone into the nuts and bolts here. 
I would love to maybe spend some time um, working on maybe some case studies. Um, you don't necessarily have to share numbers, but just to get our listeners' minds going, um, some case studies to say, hey, here's what happens when you only file takedowns and that seller continues to operate similar to what you said, like they just removed the brand name from the product and that other business competitor made millions of dollars and eventually that other one went out of business versus other more egregious ones. Uh, yeah, that, so when brands only do takedowns, it's really infor- uh, unfortunate. Um, what typically happens is you sign up with a company like Core Search or Red Points and you're paying them a couple thousand dollars per month for the rest of time uh, to play whack-a-mole. Um, and really what, if you only use that takedown strategy, you're, you're training your infringers to just keep tweaking and modifying their listings so that they're just out of reach of being ever uh, able to truly take those listings down. Um, whereas, you know, had you taken legal action, uh, strong legal action at, at the beginning of time, you know, they might have just altogether decided uh, decide to not, you know, sell that product at all and compete with you at all. Um, so, you know, that, that's, uh, one example, um, I can go through, I I've actually, in addition to my brother's toy company, I have my own very small e-commerce business where I've sued counterfeiters. Um, and I can walk you through that if you'd like. Yeah, I I would love to hear it. Um, so I, I found this brand that had been counter that was being counterfeited. Um, and it looked like the, the owners of the business were no longer really operating the company at all. Um, and so I got in touch with them and I found out they had a ton of inventory and I mean, they couldn't compete with the counterfeiters. They were selling their products. The counterfeiters were selling the product for a third of what, uh, the U S based company was able to sell theirs. The counterfeiters were using a trademark. It's called brochette express. Um, and it's, uh, this basically this device that it looks like a, a cube or a three dimensional rectangle, um, where you put a bunch of meat in it and vegetables. And you put these metal skewers down through it, and then it enables you to put a knife through the cube and start cutting uh, kebabs or brochettes. Um, so it was a really cool product, but they just were eviscerated by the counterfeiters. Um, so for whatever reason, they decided not to continue to operate the business, and I bought it. I bought the intellectual property. I bought all their inventory. Um, and then you know the next step, of course, was to clean up the, the marketplace. Um, so I, I knew takedowns don't work like we talked about. Um, and so, you know, I followed the exact legal strategy that we talked about. I went on to Amazon. I found all the product listings that were using Brichette Express or a very close uh, variation of that. They needed to be products that were, uh, you know, very similar to the authentic product that uh, the brand sells. Um, and then I found a ton of instances of counterfeiters, infringers using uh actual brands images um you know they might not also be using the trademark as well it, it could just be you know you have a mix of infringers some use both your trademarks and your copyrights others use only one um so i compiled this massive list i think it was hundreds of counterfeiters into a spreadsheet um like we talked about i took screenshots um i ordered one product or i tried to in every situation that i could i ordered one product to my warehouse um we took pictures of the shipping labels, uh, the, the products, um, documented everything. Um, and then, you know, not to, to bore you, we uh, no, executed is, the legal strategy. Great. Keep, keep going. Keep going with this. <laughs> um, I, I like this. Keep going. I love the okay. details. Um, so we, we filed uh, the case. I think it must have been two, two or three hundred uh, infringers in the Western District of Texas uh, down in Austin where I'm based. Um, we got a new judge, but, uh, he kind of understood the legal strategy. Um, and you know, we just, we went from there. So we took that list of infringers. Uh, we, we gave it to the court. They reviewed the evidence. They looked through all the screenshots, all the images of the product. Um, and they gave us a court order. Um, so we, we immediately took that to Amazon, eBay, wish.com, Walmart, um, and all, you know, I think maybe even Etsy, Newegg, I mean, everyone. Um, and so uh, the marketplace has complied with that, uh, that court order and the subpoena. They gave us the infringer's email addresses. Um, so that allowed us to serve the defendants, you know, because 
you have to do that. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to just freeze someone's assets and they don't know why it happened or what's going on. Um, and then from there, uh, I worked with my attorney to just negotiate, you know, fair settlements. Um, and then, uh, you know, many infringers had some money in their accounts and uh, the ones that didn't settle, we obtained a default judgment. Um, and so what that's called is if a defendant doesn't appear in a lawsuit, the judge just says, well, look, this this guy didn't even try to defend himself. So, I mean, he's effectively guilty um, unless he appears ever in the future. Um, so you take that judgment um, and you bring it to the, all the marketplaces that I described and payment processors as well. And, uh, you know, you just take the money in their accounts. Um, so a lot of information. But what was really nice about that is that the money that we earned in that lawsuit um, exceeded the price uh, that I paid to buy that business's intellectual property and their inventory. Um, so in some ways, like I got the, the, I made some money in the lawsuit and I got the inventory for free, um, which That's was nice. Amazing. Um, amazing. And then are you still selling that product now? And how's it doing now that the infringers uh, it, are gone? It's doing okay. Uh, I, you know, it's a very small percentage of, uh, the, the brand can only generate a small percentage of my income. So I, I focus on Edison and doing these lawsuits. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's alive. Um, I think we actually, we had to do a second lawsuit recently, um, but there were a fewer number of defendants and it was a new group. Um, you know, there's just so many people in Asia and all over the world that are getting into e-commerce. And so you're always going to have, you know, smaller, new amounts of infringers to take care of. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was a, it was wild. It was a wild ride. Um, and I got to experience it as an actual brand owner, just like my brother did, um, as yeah. opposed to, to helping other brands do this. Well, I think that that is the ninja hack of all hacks to go acquire another brand and you act at a lower amount than what you're going to collect from, you know, if you start off with this IP infringement strategy. So I, I think that is fascinating. I love that. Um, Hill, and I'm interested to learn just a little bit more about what happened after you filed the lawsuit. I would love to get in maybe to the, the nitty gritty there of, you know, you, fi you filed this lawsuit against 200, 300 people um, or competitors, right? You go to the judge who then says, yeah, we see this as infringing. Do they go one by one and say, this person's infringing, this one isn't. Like, are they going through that whole list of 200, 300? Or are they just saying, yep, yeah, it seems legit. Here's your order to go tell Amazon or eBay or Etsy or whatever that you now need to get their personal information, their, you know, how much money's in their account. Can you walk through that a little bit more? Well, we like to only sue, uh, help our, our clients sue uh, infringers that we know are going to be successful um, okay. in suing. So uh, we typically always get, we've always gotten a TRO, the the court order that freezes assets um, for every one of our clients. Um, so, I mean, in theory, you could file one of these cases and the judge could say, hey, you know, 10% of these, these defendants are not infringing. Um, but in that situation, it'd be pretty uh, dangerous because the judge might just deny the entire TRO um, mm. and ask you to dismiss those 10 defendants and refile. Um, so that wouldn't be a good situation. Uh, so we've been able to avoid that. Um, I, it might sound like all oh, this is like, I'm making it sound really easy, but uh, a lot goes into to picking the defendants and choosing who to sue um, and who to pursue outside of litigation. Um, so so typically the, the judge goes through the evidence or their clerk does one by one. Um, and then they just grant you a blanket uh, court order over all the defendants in the lawsuit. Um, okay. And so the defendants actually have, uh, after you, you have two weeks to serve the defendants. And then uh, another hearing uh, is held it's called the, the preliminary injunction. And so that hearing actually makes the asset freeze, the temporary restraining order permanent if you're successful. Um, but the defendants okay. have an opportunity to appear at that hearing to two to four weeks later um, to object. And, you know, they have an opportunity to tell the judge, you know, Hey, I don't, I don't think I'm infringing. I spelled Nike okay. with a Y, <laughs> you know, yeah. something like that. Interesting. Okay. So you get the order, you then take that to the marketplaces, right? 
Um, and then you have basically two weeks to serve them, right? And again, if somebody's located overseas, you're not serving them by having somebody go to their doorstep. You're able to serve them digitally through the email address that you get from the marketplace, I guess. And that works. Yes, that that's uh, one of the most critical parts is that email service in these types of lawsuits is allowed. Um, and the reason for that is because these defendants are operating businesses online and therefore they should be able to accept communication over the Internet. Um, and then the next thing is that they're they're based in China. Their addresses and identities are unknown anyway. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it would be extremely difficult to uh, actually send them uh, a letter in the mail. Um, so. One time, actually, a judge asked us to uh, follow through with Hague service, and uh, that was a nightmare. It cost us like $100,000 just for one lawsuit. Um, oh. My business fronted and paid for all that. Uh, that's what we do. Um, and so we literally had to pay for investigators to travel all around China and, and try to verify if the addresses that Amazon gave us were true. Um, and it was just, it was such a ma massive waste of time. It was embarrassing. Um, the judge ultimately realized that it was totally unnecessary. Um, but just to, to tell you how insane this was, our investigator would go to a building and go to, you know, floor two, suite number seven. And instead of it being some e-commerce business, it turns out to be a preschool, you know, <laughs> and the guy who claims to be operating his business there is nowhere to be found. Um, or, you know, sometimes the address would lead to just a field with no buildings in sight. <laughs> and Amazon's not verifying this, even though they, they say they do. Um, or, you know, even a floor on a building that doesn't even exist. The building's three floors high and the, the address that we got from Amazon says sixth floor, the sixth floor. Um, so, yeah, luckily you can serve via email and we get to completely uh, avoid Hague service or service via mail. Yeah, <laughs> that is wild. Um, of those people, did anybody show up in court, right, where they, they can appear? Or was it kind of a blanket, like you got the default judgment against all 300 of these? Or, you know, what's been your experience overall? Like, are you seeing these overseas sellers actually show up when they do get served? Or are you seeing 99% of the time they don't respond, they don't show up? What are you seeing? Um, I'd say maybe 70 or 80% of the time the defendants actually uh try to negotiate um okay a very small percentage low single digit actually uh go to that the preliminary injunction hearing after they're served okay. to try to object to the asset freeze um and i mean an even smaller percentage of those defendants are actually successful um yeah. so that's not something to worry about. You know, it really, it depends on, is your evidence strong? Is this a good case? And, you know, we only try to do the good ones. Um, so yeah. that's an important part. Um, and then, uh, you know, a percentage of the defendants, maybe 20, 30% of the defendants that try to settle ultimately choose not to. And they say, fine, take the $5,000 in my e-commerce account. Um, and so then we're able to, because we'll obtain a $100,000 judgment against each defendant. And so we can mm. take up to that amount. Um, and then finally, sometimes we obtain that judgment. And then the defendant's like, oh, my gosh, you just took all my money. This is actually a real thing. <laughs> and then they, they try to vacate the judgment, uh, which means like effectively undo it and then negotiate after the judgment. And so, you know, we'll come up with a fair settlement with them. Um, they may pay us a little bit more than we collected from them because they want their account back. Or we might return some money. Um, because, you know, the, the amount of sales that they did didn't justify exactly, uh, how much, uh, money we took from them or, you know, uh, we learned to a greater extent exactly what their infringement situation was. And so we figure it out after the fact, Love but that. yeah, it's a very fluid process. Right. And this takes like nine to 18 months to, to collect the money and do all those negotiations. Um, but the nice thing about the legal strategy is you get to freeze the assets within probably two to three months of kind of starting the process. Interesting. Love this. Hilton, I could ramble on with you and ask you questions for the next hour about this entire strategy. But I think that we will kind of start to wrap things up here just because there's so much. Um, 
that goes into all of this. But I think what you shared is super valuable to our listeners. The overall takeaway that I want our listeners to understand is that just sending the takedown notice is not enough. And to me, as I've been going through this, I need to go back and look at all the people we've sent IP takedown notices to start documenting them because man, we, we could have a very large list at this point. And we, what we are finding is that to your point, once we do the takedown, then they'll go modify their product. They still stay in the same um, category as us. They just modify it just enough to where it's not infringing that Amazon won't accept it. And then they're, they're, they're free, so to speak. Right. Um, but if we were to slap them and, uh, you know, actually get money, I think that it would allow us to stay a lot more competitive. It would remove our, uh, remove a significant amount of competition from the marketplace. And I think that is what every Amazon seller is struggling with right now. Increased competition. It's a race to the bottom. Uh, overseas sellers, you know, sometimes it's for mon- money laundering purposes. They're just trying to sell anything, even if it's at a loss. So they get cash into the US and that's about it. So I love this. Uh, I could harp on it more and more. So Hillen, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you think we really need to share with the audience? Um, let me, uh, I've got some notes here. I just want to make sure. Um, you got to follow Molson Hart on Twitter. <laughs> So I, I would, you know, he's my brother, um, but he, in my opinion, is one of the best, if not the best e-commerce follows on Twitter. Um, you're going to learn all about uh, a lot about what we talked about today. Um, I think you can learn about manufacturing in Asia, uh, building warehouses in the U.S. Um, he speaks Chinese uh, and I founded uh, the business we talked about today with him. Um, so awesome. Great. Well, it sounds like we'll have to have him on the podcast. So yeah, maybe a lot. Of, you guys would talk a lot about China, I'd imagine. <laughs> I love it. Well, Hilton, this has been awesome. As we wrap things up, I love to leave our audience with three actionable takeaways um, from every episode. So here are the actionable takeaways um, for our listeners. Number one, create an IP enforcement or protection strategy for your brand. If you haven't considered a registering your trademark, that should be a given, but do that. If you're not registering copyrights for either your product images or, you know, if you're actually designing products, you should start doing that now. And to Hilton's point, he said, you don't need an attorney to go file copyrights uh, um, with the government. It's actually a very easy process. There's tons of YouTube videos about it. I promise even a VA can figure out that pro- that that process. Um, and then if you're if you have brand new products, you know, that are completely, you know, entirely new, um, then look at pursuing a utility patent or either a design patent as well to provide that IP protection for you. So that's number one. Action item number two is that you should take your IP infringement um, enforcement seriously. If you see somebody that is copying you, whether they're using your brand name or even colors um, that are similar to your brand. Um, They're copying your images. They're copying the actual design of the product, whatever it may be. Start documenting all of that. Even purchase the product, take screenshots of it, um, and file those takedown notices with Amazon. But don't just file the takedown notices and think that it's all said and done. Make sure you've documented everything which then would lead to action item number three is once you've got a big long list, probably around, I don't know what you would recommend, Hilton, is it 20, 50, 100 sellers that you would recommend until you actually file one of these lawsuits? But that would be my third action item is like, then go collect money from these people that are infringing on you and they're going to stop competing with you most of the time. So I don't know, would you recommend, is there a given number of like uh, counterfeiters that you want in a lawsuit? just to have one number, 50 plus, 100 plus. Um, but, you know, counterfeiters on different marketplaces are not considered, are not equal in terms of what you can collect. So you can collect more from an Amazon defendant than you can collect from an AliExpress defendant. So maybe, you know, an Amazon defendant's worth two times as much uh, from a financial perspective um, in terms of collection. Um, so that would be good to keep in mind. Makes sense. I love this. All right, Hilton. 
It's time for the final three questions here. What's been the most influential book that you've read and why? Um, so this is not necessarily about e-commerce, um, but I, I just would pick one up on Wall Street. Um, I read that years ago. Um, and while it helps, you know, helps you invest in public equities, I thought it applies to business um, in a number of ways. Um, so some of the points that I really like about it is Peter Lynch is the he's always talking about focus on on what you know. And so, you know, it's really important, I think, to leverage your your strengths. Um, so mine were, were software and finance, um, you know, thinking long term, not trying not to cut corners. Uh, you want to do things that uh, build your company's moat and, you know, extend the runway. Don't just try to get cheap, tiny little wins. Um, you know, and, and for our business, having a margin of safety and asymmetric risk and reward is really important. Um, so, you know, if you're spending money in business, um, you want to make sure you're going to make multiples of that and with the high likelihood. So we have an extensive system where we appraise these lawsuits and we look at all the infringers and we, you know, like I described earlier, you want to make sure there's money in their accounts, the infringement's strong, you're, you're pursuing enough infringers, the attorney's going to get paid and be happy, um, and, and things like that. Um, yeah. So I really like public and uh, equities, but uh, that I learned a lot a couple of years ago reading that. I love that book. I haven't heard about that one, so I've got that on the list now. All right, Hill. And question number two: What is your favorite productivity tool or a new software tool that you've recently discovered that you think is a game changer? Mm -hmm. uh, so a new one. Uh, we started using uh, the software from a company called Predictive Index, um, and what that what they provide is behavioral tests and cognitive tests, which we give to our employees and prospective hires. Um, so what's really cool about it is that you can take a job post that you've written and kind of upload it to their software. They'll analyze it and, and kind of uh, basically give you like the behavior or the type of person that you're really looking for. Um, you have to answer a number of questions as well. Um, and so then it gives you kind of like this model. And then what you do is you have all your prospective hires, um, your candidates take that test and you try to see who matches up perfectly with uh, the answers to the questions you gave and your job post. Um, and that's just been so helpful for us because, you know, I'm able to kind of weed out, you know, the, and, and only end up with the perfect fits. And I've saved myself so much time in interviewing um, and, and things like that. So I'm really happy with how my hiring's going lately as opposed to years ago when I, I didn't use that software. Um, That's great. I can, I can say Gmail and Zero Inbox as well if you'd like me to let's, describe let's that. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Okay. Um, three, four years ago, I probably could handle a quarter of the emails uh, that I'm handling these days. Um, and I'm only able to do that because of Zero Inbox. Um, so essentially what's involved is you create a number of Google groups and you have your customers emailing those and you, you have automatic labels being applied to those. Um, and so then uh, you're able to actually decide, okay, I'm going to not context switch and I'm going to focus on one area of my business or emails that came in with you know, one concern or type uh, of, of concerns. Um, and so from there, it's really important that you archive your emails. Um, you don't just mark them as red and you leave them in your inbox. Um, I'm snoozing emails. Uh, you know, if I think someone else is going to handle something later, snooze it into the future. Um, and then I also use auto advance. So after I archive an email or snooze it, it just takes me to the next one in my inbox. Um, and, and my inbox is only showing me the, the Google group or, you know, the division of my company's emails that I care about. So because of that, I'm able to get through two or 300 emails a day. I don't answer them all, um, but I'm reading every single one uh, that basically my company gets. That's amazing. That's a great strategy. Is it something that you just kind of developed on your own or was it like watching YouTube videos, mm -hmm. learning from somebody else? Uh, yeah, I saw a couple people talk about it on Twitter. Um, I wish I had the link handy. I'd share it with uh, you guys. Um, but yeah, there should be some YouTube videos or Twitter threads that you know, describe exactly how to do the settings in Gmail or, you know, it's applicable to any email client. Um, so I highly recommend that people do that. Um, I've tried to get basically everyone at my company to do it. 
Um, some people really re resist. They just can't handle archiving an email <laughs> um, and things like that. But I, I basically guarantee you that it's going to be useful. Yeah, that's amazing. Love that tip. All right, Hilton, last question. Who is somebody that you admire or respect in the most in the e-commerce space that other people should be following and why? Uh, I realize I, I, uh, I guess I answered that one earlier, but it's Molson Hart. Um, it's not just because he's my brother. Um, you know, he's, a, he's really contrarian. He thinks for himself. He's a jack of all trades. Um, I mean, he, he's, he was my original mentor. I still consider him my mentor. Um, you can really learn a lot uh, from following him. Um, I'm not just telling people to follow him to get his numbers up. I mean, you're going to really learn a lot if you do. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Hilton, this has been amazing. Uh, thanks for sharing all of your insights with us today. If people want to learn more about you or they want to even hire your services to go and sue these counterfeiters and start collecting money from them, um, how can people reach out to you and learn more? Uh, you can submit a form on our website and that email that will turn into an email, which goes to, directly to me. Um, or you can email me directly. Uh, my email address is HH as in Hilton Hart. Uh, so it's HH at Edison dot com. Um, it's very easy to get a hold of me. Uh, if you email me, I will, you know, review your in, intellectual property infringement situation. Um, and we'll try to help you no matter what, even if, you know, uh, our legal strategy doesn't kind of fit what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and I'm on Twitter, but uh, I'm mostly just talking about uh, public equities and things like that. You're, you yourself, you're a jack of all trades. So you're a wealth of information. Thank um, you. <laughs> so Hilton, thanks so much for your time. It was a pleasure having you on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.